Hello, Gillian, and um, thank you for joining us in our little expose on Margaret Sutherland. We're so excited about learning more about more about her. So to everybody watching, I'm talking with Gillian Graham. I should say Dr. Gillian Graham. <laughs> um, Gillian is in the process of writing the very first biography of Margaret Sutherland called, I believe it's called Beyond the Stave. Is that correct, Gillian? Well, it was going to be Beyond the Stave, um, but it is now called, at the moment, I should say, it's called An Inner Song and or it's just called in a song and that come or a biography of margaret sutherland that comes from a paper that she wrote sort of later in her career uh which she titled chant interieur which you know in english is in a song i don't know why she put it in french but it's kind of where she gave all her um really her opinions of what it really meant to be a composer and what it took to be a composer so, uh, which is very interesting, um, makes very interesting reading. So at the moment, that's what it's called, but it could change. Um, Gillian, can I just ask you initially, what, what has drawn you to Margaret Sutherland and her story? What has inspired you to write this biography? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I was thinking about this. My memory is a little bit hazy because it was way back in the 90s, uh, the, the late 90s. And a friend suggested to me that I might be interested in looking at music at the Lyceum Club in Melbourne. So the, so the women's club in Melbourne, it's all over the world, but the biggest one in the world is in Melbourne. And uh, there a lot of music going on there. So I started to look into that. And in that process, I sort of gave up on that idea, but I found out about Margaret um, because she, she'd been a very keen uh, member of the Lyceum and of course, particularly with music, she was very involved in music. And then I think the stars sort of aligned because I heard some of her music on the radio and I was starting to read about her and it just struck me um, what an unusual woman she was for her era. She was born in 1896, 1897, most place, most uh, things you see written say 1897, but her birth certificate says 1896. So I'm going with that. Um, and they say that all research is, is me search. I really like that expression. And in a way at the time I was studying and I had two young children and I was sort of wondering you know, how, how to, to do it all and how to do it all justice. And so her story piqued my interest because she was married and had children. And also I realised that my own mother, I was born a good generation after Margaret, but she, uh, she felt she really had to conform to expectations of the day and that, you know, she, she gave up work when she got married and concentrated on domestic life. But I don't think that would have been her choice in another in another era. So uh, the, I, I just got more curious to know more about um, this woman and who was such a pioneer in, in Australian music. We're really looking forward to actually sort of getting a sense of her 
through the through the notes and it's always a cu- yeah. it's always curious for us in terms of playing the music what who was the person that actually put those dots on on the page and it it does actually help inform our it does help inform our in, interpretation of um, her yeah. yeah obviously her music evolved as she went through her career it started off more on the romantic side and ended up uh, more modernistic and she was one of the really first Australian composers to experiment with the, the modern music the techniques that people were using in Europe and um, she her music got and she called it uh, the uh, tonally slanted <laughs> through a career it, the tonalities became more and more different I guess more dissonant um, she never aspired to being like Schoenberg or, or Weben uh, or Berg uh, she, she didn't want to be part of that second Viennese school she didn't really like 12 tone music she managed to maintain really her own individual style even though she got sort of more and more dissonant as she went on really in the third string quartet, I think probably shows that, shows that very well. But in terms of equating that with her personality, uh, when, when I was doing interviews with people who knew her back in the, in the 90s, yeah, late 90s, I got so many descriptions of what she was like as a person and they ranged from, you know, being sort of really horrible and mean and uh, cold and to warm and, and kind and uh, you, you name it, she was it. So obviously she was a very complex person, but what I noted, um, I noted particularly from some of the ABC interviews she did when she was late in her career, um, when they did interviews for her 75th and 80th birthdays. And she was, she was quite cranky, I have to say. She could be quite cranky. She'd obviously been asked these questions a lot uh, during her life and she was getting a bit, bit over them. And, um, but I, I think she was anyway not always easy. Um, and I, I remember being in Sydney looking at uh, the National Archives and looking at the ABC records of, you know, various interactions she'd had with the ABC. And there were two letters there that were just doozies. So it was 1940 and the ABC had put on this series of programs of Australian music and she was absolutely horrified. And, and um, you could tell that from these letters and she did not hold back. So, but that part of her character um, she used um, to, to, to good ends, I think, to really fight for Australian music and Australian composers. And I guess one of the best examples of that um, is the Art Centre. Um, uh, she was very involved in setting up the Combined Art Centre movement, or she was the leading light, really. And then there was Lorna Sterling and John Lloyd who joined her and then all sorts of other people. But she fought for years to get that art centre set up where it is because when the National Gallery was moving from Russell Street and they'd sort of found this site on St Kilda Road, she said, hang on a minute, we don't just need a, a National Gallery, we need a whole art centre. Um, people are wanting, craving more music, she reckoned. And so that was really, I guess, the most obvious to everybody of her of the, her examples of really lobbying and, and <clears throat> fighting for Australian music. It's yeah. so interesting. I, that's the first time I think I've actually heard such a personal description of, of Margaret and you draw such an amazing, vivid picture of her. And it's interesting because I wanted to, to talk about her unique musical language. I feel like, I mean, at the moment, I'm in hotel quarantine in Adelaide, madly learning her <laughs> first and third string quartets, which we're about to um, to to perform um, yes. and one thing that I was sort of trying to work out you know what is Margaret's language and trying to describe it for somebody who's never heard her music and I thought it's incredibly unique 
Mm. I find it incredibly strong in character. It's not, um, there's no doubt in what it is that she wants to say on, no. on, the, on the music. Mm-hmm. And it's, and that really matches your description. That's I, so in terms of, um, and you can hear the, you can hear the influence of, you know, the 20th century, 20th century music, but yes, in, in actual fact, there's a distinct lyricism in there yes. that, uh, that, that I, that I really, that I really, really, I'm really loving actually getting to know. It's, yes. yes. So if, we look, if we look, if I can bring it back to her, her, her string quartets and actually what, oh. Mm-hmm. So, because um, just being selfish, I want to know how it all, you know, so how I can understand her a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Her, over her three string quartets, and she wrote th- three. The second one is a shorter one, isn't it? Yes, yeah. that's right. The second one is is a shorter one. It's called Discussion, yeah. uh, or sort of nickname Discussion, I guess. And um, that's because I think that's how she saw uh, the string quartet in general. Like she saw it as all four voices having sort of an equal role in a way and, and like having a, a conversation, really. She loved writing chamber music. Uh, I mean, there, there there's an interesting quote that she, she uh, made at some point uh, in an interview with James Murdoch, who, who was... Um, not the James Murdoch we know, but arts administrator and pianist and general advocate for Australian music. And this was in 1968. And and she said, a woman can contribute in a special kind of way. I don't think the women want to write the same type of things as men, but their contribution is no less important. And she said, men seem to have the same yardstick all the time, this symphonic business. So so I think she, she, that that was sort of a comment, I guess, on uh, perhaps she'd been criticized for, um, not writing enough orchestral music or something. I, I'm not sure quite where that came from. But she did love the intimacy of writing for smaller groups. And, of course, the other thing is that she's she was more likely to get them performed because she had a lot of friends in the musical community and she would often write for them. Um, and she would... She loved different mixes of instruments too. So... And I think that was because she genuinely did like, you know, being original in that way, but also because she wrote for people she knew often. So, you know, um, combinations that she thought she could, she could put together. Mm. Yeah. But, but definitely chamber music was her forte and she did write more orchestral music later in her life, but uh, I think she was more adept and more comfortable in writing chamber music. In your knowledge, Gillian, has the third quartet, it hasn't been recorded, but it was no. performed, wasn't it? It was performed because the third quartet was one was one of only two professional commissions that she ever received. So, and that was late in her career, very late in her career, nineteen sixty seven, and you, you probably were, but APRA um, commissioned it, mm-hmm. and it was actually written with a purpose in mind, which was um, to celebrate fifty years of her compositional life. And there was a concert apparently in the assembly hall in Collins Street in Melbourne. And that was where this was performed. Um, But strangely, it wasn't recorded. And um, that seems a bit strange, you know, given it was it was commissioned. Um, But and I think it by this stage of her career, which is kind of the last two years, really, when she was writing because she went she went blind. she really, uh, she wanted to show that she was up to the minute in terms of writing contemporary music. Um, be, even though she didn't really, she wasn't really into 12 tone, that sort of serialism or anything. Uh, she, she wanted to show she could, she could do it in a way. And I think there was a lot of new music being played in Melbourne at the time, the ABC, through the ABC and the um, International Centre for Contemporary Music or, or whatever it was called that, that had just been revived in Melbourne then. So she was hearing a lot. And, and I think that this third string quartet is probably a lot more dissonant uh, or, or more experimental, really, than, than the first string quartet. You might know from playing. That, um, the same way that if you see a painting that's a little bit jarring, mm. you don't, not the kind of 
if I can allude it to or sort of make that analogy with a painting, mm. that it's not that um, it's not the kind of thing where you see a painting and you think, oh my gosh, I can't look at. That. I actually find that difficult to look at. Yes, so yes. I, the same ways with music, you think, actually, I find that really difficult to listen to. I can't mm-hmm. listen to it. It's not that it's actually just interesting. Yes. So the, the the music, it's it's sort of the kind of thing where if you saw a painting, you think, wow, I wouldn't have thought to approach that subject matter in that way. Mm. And it draw and it draws you in. And her music is that is that same thing. It's um it's still inviting. It's still yes. it's still really approachable to listen to. <laughs> with Margaret Sutherland's music happened when Ben Opie introduced me to the string trio and Coronglay work. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's it's absolutely stunning. So much personality and and just really interesting. And, um, you know, we sort of, we performed it on a couple of rehearsals and it just made me hungry for more. It's interesting. Some early commentators, um, probably not just early commentators, felt that her music was quite um, cerebral and intellectual and even cold and I've never understood that description because to me it feels like it's deeply emotional it's just not necessarily emotional in that um heart on the sleeve type way you know but it's it feels like it's very um personal to her in a way and obviously uh she you know she didn't belong to any particular school of music it, it was very personal her music but at the same time she did want to she did she just didn't want to keep writing lovely romantic tunes you know she really wanted to um, be experimental and find her own voice it is interesting that idea and I think that quite often composers are at the mercy of the performers in selling their voice and and their vision and in in reality, what often often happens as a performer is that if you're introduced to a new composer, a new piece of music, mm-hmm. you've only got a certain amount of time to bring it to life. Yes. And so, you know, in the temptation is to start and end with the dots on the page and lining them up together. Yes. Not yes. to go not to go deeper. So I can do I, I can well understand actually mm-hmm. um, you know how you know that initial reaction to her music. Because it's just that's just the, the logistics of being a, mu- a musician and a composer. That's I'm not sort of criticizing the process. Just that's mm. just the reality. And what needs to happen actually is that pieces they have their own they have their own life. So mm. if we look at actually the way string quartets are interpreting Beethoven, you can track sort of an old school interpretation and right through to a modern interpretation. If I mm. say. 21st century interpretation we mm. don't play Beethoven the same way as we did in the 20th oh, century no, like no, any little ballad. No. it really, mm. really doesn't um but composers who don't have that gift of having their music have that that journey in life which Margaret you know hasn't really until this point it's really wonderful to see a lot of people getting excited about her music now I can only hope oh, yes. that we can get to we can get inside can get inside that personality Oh, I'm, 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 I'm sure you, I'm sure you can. Uh, I mean, I suppose it's like performing music. Well, my, my own experience. It, it sometimes takes a while to get into something, and you look at it eventually, initially, and you're working out the notes and you know all this sort of thing, and then gradually it kind of you start to get it, and it, it gets inside you, you know. So, I hope that um, Sutherland does this for, for you. Yeah, for this quartet. Mm. It's, it's, I mean, I don't want to um, sort of focus on, um, I think that Margaret Sutherland is amazing reg- regardless. I just think that she stands up there in, in the great Australian composers regardless, mm. of, be- regardless of being female. Yes. But, but that said, what makes it all the more extraordinary is the fights that she had to go through in order to actually even legitimise herself as a composer, can you talk to us about just 
for just a little, you know, touch on her marriage and actually. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And, and her decision to become a composer. Well, she wanted to uh, start with being a composer. She was sort of fiddling around on the piano very early on. And she was got taught piano very early by her by an aunt of hers. But I think, um, well, the thing about her, her being uh, female, which sort of is tied in with her marriage, really, but I think her whole family background uh, led her to expect more um, than she, you know, I think it led her to expect to be more accepted as a, as a female composer than, than, than she was or, or she didn't expect to have such a struggle because her family was so amazing and they always encouraged her and she spent a lot of time with her father uh, in her very early years because he worked this was when she was in Adelaide and he worked for the Adelaide Register he's a journalist and so he worked later in the day he went to work later in the day and all her much older siblings had already gone to school she had lots of time with with dad and then she came to Melbourne and was involved with this this family, all her aunts and uncles, she had three single aunts and two single uncles all living in one house. They were very nearby. She spent a lot of time there. They would have discussions about all sorts of things and the women will be, you know, Aldous Huxley and, um, I get it, Aldous Huxley, is it? And um, Darwin and, and all sorts of things. And the women would be just as involved as the men. So she had this kind of expectation, I think, um, that life would be easier uh, professionally than, than, it, than it really turned out to be. And her marriage, I mean, her husband, Norman Alberston, who was a psychiatrist, he was really interested in music and he, he played himself and he dabbled in a bit of composition, apart from being a medico. Uh, but he didn't really understand her desire, her strong desire to compose. Uh, and I, and I guess he was it was partly just being a man of his time that he he would have expected probably that his wife be a, a bit meeker and a bit more domesticated than Margaret was and uh, it just I mean there's all she's written about it she she didn't say much about it at all while she was married she kept it quite quiet until for quite a long time and I guess that was partly the times. But later on, she sort of um, she did she did write about the struggles she had, and of course they're all from her point of view, and you have to bear that in mind. But she she uh, I was going to say held a big grudge. That's not r really the right term, but but she was very bitter about it, and I, I think that's another part of her character that she actually was quite easily offended and easily hurt but she held that held that you know to herself for quite a while um so she she did say while she was married that she she actually did compose quite a lot when she was married uh, a, a lot of people say she blossomed you know when the marriage ended and started to write a lot and it's true to a certain extent especially orchestral music but she did turn out a lot of music while she was married and she commented she sometimes had to get out of the house to 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 compose and I mean she had young children too so you know it, it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been easy but she was very determined which is part of a character that might have also made her a bit difficult sometimes I suppose. Well we certainly I mean look we really certainly have Margaret to thank for for so much today I mean not only the art center mm. but, she, but she is a, a shining light and such a role model for all composers today not just um, female composers that yeah. that sort of that's a given that you know female mm. composers that are trying to do it all and um, you know be a mother and sort of keep a house running alongside or play their role in the family alongside being a creative person but she really is a role yeah. model for anybody who has any sort of fight to get their music heard or anybody who's looking for inspiration and having a belief in their own that's capabilities. Right. That's right. That's right. Another interesting thing about her was she, she was really critical of other composers who did, who, who did it just for money or who, who wrote sort of more acceptable, more popular music um, because they needed the money. Uh, she, she was 
she was critical of that. She thought you should always be experimenting and finding new ways of, of doing things. And some people say to me, oh, well, maybe that's because um, she came from such a, you know, a privileged background. Well, it was privileged in the sense of being intellectual, artistic, creative and encouraging her, but, but they were never terribly wealthy. They were, so, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's just... Um, an, an interesting, interesting, uh, interesting woman. But yeah, a bit spiky sometimes, as her music is. <laughs> Gillian, wh when can we expect this biography? When can we read all about Margaret? I'd say early next year. <gasps> Brilliant. It's been really illuminating talking to you, and I feel like I have more of a sense of who Margaret was as a person. Well, and, <laughs> um, and, and I'm glad that you were so honest with us about about her as a person we'd like to think of composers as um you know being congenial and lovely to work with but sounds well, like she, I might could have, she could be but not always i might have been a little bit afraid of her i would have practiced a lot i think before playing her, <laughs> her pieces yes, i i agree with you i mean i never met her and i think oh gosh you know she probably would not be the sort of person you want to be on the wrong wrong side of but i think to those that she respected and liked, she was also very, very lovely. So yeah, that, that, that I, I think I would love her for that, for actually pushing, pushing everybody just to be at their best. Pushing the boundaries, definitely. Yeah. Yes, yes, she did. She did. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's also fantastic that the Flinders Quartet is taking on her music and, and it's a, just a wonderful project. And I was very excited when I found out about it. <laughs> well, I hope we're the first of many quartets to be playing her music we're hoping that all around the country and hopefully around the world that people will start falling in love with margaret sutherland that would be, be nice better late than never better late than never absolutely yes yeah. all right brilliant thank you Gillian. thank you zoe